All right. First, we got Muhammad Hamza joining us from Pakistan. Welcome, Muhammad. Um, we're also, uh, I think we're now live on YouTube, so hopefully we can get some comments from the folks watching us there. I also um, have a quick, uh, quick little question I wanted to ask the folks who were joining us. I'm curious uh, which frameworks people are using for their experiments. So uh, if, you, um, if you've been training models recently, if you've been doing some deep learning and machine learning, uh, go to this link, itempool.com slash WNB slash live. And then you can enter your uh, uh, you can enter your answer there. There's a couple different options, and we'll come back and give people a second to look there and uh, put their answers in, and we'll see what what people have said. So, uh, are uh, some folks probably a lot of folks using uh, PyTorch? Oh, my TensorFlow should have been an option there. So maybe a lot of people are going to say something else. They're going to say it mean TensorFlow slash Keras. I don't know how that one didn't get included. Uh, but yeah, so we've already got two answers. And we'll come back and see what the remaining answers are in uh, maybe after this talk. Hey, Charles, really quick. I'm going to start and stop the recording again, just so I can do a local version of it. Um, okay. So you might just get a loud person saying that this meeting is being recorded. Great. Great, okay, we are all set. Thanks. Cool, thanks, Caleb. All right, so uh, let's let's get started with our, our first talk. So we, uh, for our first talk, we have Mohamed Reza Amirian, who is joining us from Switzerland. He's doing a joint PhD at the University in Ulm and at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Uh, he's another person who came into machine learning and deep learning a little bit from more the bio biology side working on biophysical signals and signal processing, and in particular on signals involving pain. Uh, and now he's doing some work on computer vision and, uh, and in particular on radial basis function networks and how they can be integrated with convolutional networks. So I'm really excited to see uh, this sort of classical machine learning method combined with newer uh, state-of-the-art techniques. So uh, Mohamed Reza, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Charles and Kyla. So I'm quite excited to present our uh, recent research work uh, jointly done at Zurich University of Applied Sciences and Ulm University. And uh, this work is about uh, integrating radial basis function networks uh, to convolutional neural networks and using them for computer vision. This research is uh, guided with my PhD advisor Friedhelm Schwenker from Ulm University and motivated by my uh, second PhD advisor Chilo Stalman from Zurich University of Applied Sciences. So uh, the radial basis function neural networks are three layer uh, neural networks. They have been introduced first in 1988 for a given input feature vector in the forward pass, first we compute the distances of these uh, features to some cluster centers, which are encoded in the hidden layer. And afterwards we apply a activation function to these distances and then train a output weight in order that to uh, specify the classes. Radial basis function can also be used for regression. In this research, we adopted the training process of the RBFs and also uh, proposed an activation function in order that they can be integrated into CNNs. And as an advantage, we actually can learn a similarity distance metric. And we could also interpret the decision, met, uh, the decision process of uh, the computer vision models using RBFs by looking at, at the clusters and distribution of the training and test samples around the clusters. The related works regarding uh, Mohan, RBF, real yes. quick, um, uh, are you intending to share your screen, the slides you had? Uh, yes. Can you see the slides or? I currently don't see the slides. I think your uh, screen sharing is turned off. 
Okay. Um, think it's sharing, but perhaps it seems like it's sharing. It's working from my end. Oh. Okay, I figured it out. My bad. Go keep going. Okay. So, can you see the slides now? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, so, the you're welcome. And the related works uh, related to the RBF networks are divided into three categories. So some works are focusing on the training process. There are different uh, type of training process, one, two, and three phase learning for RBFs. And here we actually combined uh, two phases of training the RBFs by combining supervised and unsupervised learning. There are several different activation functions proposed in the literature for RBF networks based on uh, different applications and here we propose a quadratic fun function in order that we can have a completely linear uh, computational graph for efficient gradient flow for CNNs. And in terms of applications, CNNs are used uh, for classification, regression, and even function mathematical function interpolation. So here uh, we present the first attempt of uh, using RBFs in conjunction with CNNs for computer vision. Okay. So um, here I explain the training process of radial basis networks. In the hidden layer, as I mentioned earlier, the cluster centers are encoded. Here you can see an unsupervised loss uh, inspired by k-means algorithm. The first sum shows uh, an average over the clusters and the second is aimed at minimizing the distance between uh, feature vectors and a cluster center. Traditionally, the feature space uh, used to be fixed for radial basis function networks, but in a, the architecture that we use it, we feed the embeddings of CNNs which are trained uh, during the training process. So the input features of the RBFs are not fixed anymore. Therefore, we include this loss function in the training in order that the cluster centers are updated during the training process of the RBF uh, networks and CNNs. Then we have to compute the distance. As you can see, the distance can be defined based on a distance metric. If we, uh, a distance metric could be Euclidean distance, if we train uh, the main diagonal of the co covariance matrix, then we end up with having a Mahalanobis distance and the entire covariance matrix can also be learned. And we can write it in terms of matrix multiplication, as you can see over here. Then we apply activations. And at the end, we can uh, estimate the ground truth label shown by Y by a multiplication of output weights and the activations. And initializing the clusters are basically the second phase of the optimization and the one phase training algorithm of RBF only, up the, uh, only computes the weights of the output layer. And the third phase is fine tuning the model using gradient descent end to end. In order to adapt the RBFs to CNNs, as we said, uh, we first comp uh, we connect the backbone of the CNNs via a fully connected layer to the RBFs. So in principle, we flatten the features and use a fully connected without any uh, type of activation here. So experimentally, I noticed that uh, RBFs don't uh, work very well with dropout. Therefore, this uh, layer is necessary. And since we have parameters both in the hidden layer and output layer, if we use the original feature space, we easily undergo overfitting. So a fully connected layer to convert the output of the CNNs into a lower dimensional space is necessary here. Afterwards, we have the computation of the distance using matrix multiplication. And our proposed uh, activation is just um, an addition and division by a constant, which shows the width of the kernel. And at the end, during the optimization, we 
uh, uh, we optimize the unsupervised loss and minimize it, as I mentioned earlier, and we will have a supervised loss, which could be a normal softmax cross entropy or any type of other loss that we would like to optimize for classification or regression. In this slide, I would like to uh, show you how the training process works in practice. For this slide, I used uh, the MNIST dataset and on right and left, you can see the two dimensional representation of first, the input of the RBF, which is the embeddings of the CNNs and the activations, after uh, the activations of the clusters, basically after computing the distance and applying the activation functions. On left, you can see that the unsupervised loss is more prominent, means that during the training process, the data samples are divided into clusters, which are not uh, corresponding to the uh, ground truth labels. On right, uh, the other loss is more prominent, means a supervised loss. And you can see that the data samples are dividing into clusters during the training process based on the ground truth labels. In the middle figure, I uh, demonstrated the samples around a cluster center. So you can imagine that the center of the cluster is at zero and zero. Then the training samples are distributed with a random angle based on their distance to the center of this cluster. Here is where both uh, losses interact. The unsupervised loss tries to bring all the samples to the close, as close as possible to the center, as I explained earlier. And the uh, supervised loss tries to put the samples from the same classes at the same and with the same space from the cluster center. So th this is why you can see some circles with the samples uh, from same classes around this cluster. And this process continues during the uh, training of the uh, CNN and RBF architecture. Furthermore, um, we used some uh, benchmark computer vision data sets in order to confirm that uh, this architecture can work for more complicated uh, problems. Though we noticed that uh, picking the correct set of hyperparameter, including number of clusters, as well as the uh, dimensionality of the input and uh, dimensionality of the RBF is not uh, all the time trivial, so we had to use the Vaden biases toolbox in order to have a hyperparameter search. And we also use the auto augment for augmenting our images to improve the performance. So at the end, we noticed that the radial basis function networks can work with a wide range of uh, CNN backbones such as efficient net uh, and networks including inception blocks as well as residual connections. Though there is a small gap between our, the performances that we can achieve using RBFs on the top of CNNs and the state of the art, which is actually due to the overfitting. So we noticed that the training uh, data set can be learned very well, but uh, we need to have novel methods for regularization, regularization of the RBFs. At the end, uh, the metric that we learn based on the architecture of the RBFs can be used to find similar and dissimilar images. You can see that we apply to the PET data set, the data set of aircrafts, as well as BERT. And we can take a look at the position of the test images and uh, corresponding uh, closer train images around every cluster. This is not necessarily at the moment interpretable based on the ground truth label, since uh, as I visualized in the training process as well, the pr uh, these clusters are learned completely unsupervised and they are not necessary 
really uh, the position of the samples are necess not necessarily really relate to their uh, labels. At the end, we had to modify the uh, activation of the RBFs as well as its training process in order to integrate it into CNNs. We have comparable results with the state of the arts, but there is still a gap and uh, the RBFs provide us with the opportunity to have a more interpretable uh, methods and decision-making process. So maybe one of the most uh, important um, questions to, for further investigation would be that uh, the regularization techniques for RBF in order to fill the gap between our performances and the state of the art. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm very willing to hear your questions. Great, so folks have questions either on YouTube or on Zoom, type them into your respective live chats and we'll, we'll pass them on to Mohamed Reza. So uh, my first question was a little bit about the sort of readout layer on these things. Yep. So you said that you could use either a cross entropy loss or something else. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about those choices and how, they're, how you implement them or how you use them? Yeah, I mean, the output layer is actually very similar to the uh, normal output layers that uh, we kind of have for normal CNN. So depending on uh, the task that you have, you can also use mean square error as well for regression, for instance. So any type of loss function which can be used uh, in conjunction with CNNs can be used with this architecture as well. I see. So the output isn't necessarily those locations of those cluster centers um, that you were showing. That's not the final output layer of the network? No, like the output layer exactly has uh, the same structure as the output of the CNN. So it has uh, the same number as the number of classes. And uh, in principle, the training process is very the same. I see. So then what you were showing were those was the hidden layer of the RBF those were those cluster locations you were showing. Yeah, exactly. So this is basically the activation and not the output layer. So mm -hmm. I uh, visualized the, the activations. I see, yeah. So I'm just, uh, one reason I'm asking about that is I know folks have looked into ways to do classification that don't use softmax because various issues like the calibration of the softmax layer can be very difficult. It can be difficult to motivate why we're using a softmax in the first place. Uh, so it seems like those cluster centers that you have have a natural interpretation as, you know, as basically class labels, right? Which cluster it is closest to. So is that a way that you can um, sort of uh, train these networks or validate these networks? Or is that, is it important to include that, that readout and softmax? Yeah, actually, uh, that's definitely true. So uh, besides unsupervised uh, initialization of the clusters, we can also do it uh, super based on supervised methods. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, uh, the way that we, we completely use unsupervised learning on these clusters, but in principle, you can divide your classes into subclasses or superclasses even, and then you don't need the softmax layer at the end as well. So it's possible to just finish the network in the cluster level as well. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned the, uh, your interest in explainability and interpretable mm -hmm. AI. So are there, um, uh, what are some of the ways that you see this as being directly, um, uh, directly enabling greater explainability for CNNs relative to the baseline? So I would say as soon as we have these supervised clusters, we will have a much better interpretability because at the moment, like the clusters doesn't really uh, show anything interpretable based on common sense knowledge of humans. But in principle, we can divide uh, every class into subclusters or even into superclasses. And then we can kind of 
interpret how uh, where these test sample really goes and interpret these based on the ground truth labels and uh, subcategories, of course. I see. So it gives you maybe a little bit more insight into that last bit of the CNN before the readout layer, the, exactly. like the sort of enforcing this unsupervised yeah. learning stuff. Yeah, that's true. Cool. Um, all right. Well, thanks for thanks for answering those questions. Uh, and it looks like oh, we've got one from Han Lee here. Yeah. Um, so let me uh, read it out to you. So how does the latent space transform between the latent space output of the CNN backbone versus afterwards, right? So what, like, how does that, I guess he wants a little bit of, a, of insight into what changes about that last layer of the CNN and what comes out of your RBF network. All right, I think it's basically uh, just about how we can visualize the decision-making. So uh, I would say these uh, cluster centers work as support points and we kind of can explain uh, the, like the transformation of the CNN based on these uh, support points. So at the moment, since we do it completely unsupervised, they don't say anything about any kind of uh, human interpretable concept. But as soon as we uh, involve the ground truth labels into learning the clusters, then you can basically see the network made this decision because it's close to uh, cluster center A, which contains a specific attribute of the image. I see, yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. Um, and I guess one last, one last question for me. Um, so how immediately extensible is this idea to other kinds of, so like stacking it on the end of a fully, a network that's fully connected or a recurrent network on its readout layer or a, you know some other kind of network? Is there an immediate way to translate from the work you've done to that or is that another project? Uh, I would say that with uh, some reasonable effort, it could be possible to integrate RBFs as the configuration that we proposed here to other types of networks. And I mean, LSTMs or recurrent networks are a little bit tricky to train, but I still think that uh, the model that we have is uh, basically ready for plug and play to any type of deep learning method. Cool. But I would say the challenge would be to somewhat have a hyperparameter search as well as a regularization for sure. So maybe at the very beginning, it takes some time to reproduce the same performance with more interpretability. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no free lunch, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool, all right. Well, um, it's very, very late at night slash early in the morning in Switzerland. <laughs> so we'll let you go. Thanks for presenting your research. So uh, thank you very much for your interest and amazing questions. It was great to be with you. Mm -hmm. And thanks a lot for your invite. Yep. Take care. Right. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Have a good afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so next up, we've got uh, my coworker Stacy Svetlich Naya. So she's talked at the uh, at these salons in the past. So I'll give her a second to get her uh, um, get her slides up. While I while she does that, let's look at our responses on item pool. Let's see what people said. All right, so it looks like the uh, two folks said PyTorch, one person said PyTorch and something else, and one person said something else. Uh, I would guess, uh, as we said at the start, that the absence of TensorFlow slash Kiris on that list uh, means that something else is probably that. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to see. It looks like we're a little bit evenly divided between our uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow users. And uh, uh, yeah, so much like the uh, community at large. I think I had another question. This one is a little bit uh, more free form. Uh, so there's been a lot of excitement and interest on Twitter and especially uh, certain parts of venture capital and machine learning Twitter over the last couple of weeks about the GPT-3 model, the general purpose transformer three model from uh, from OpenAI. So the, this next question, uh, which you can provide your opinion on by going to itempool.com slash WNB slash live, 
which I will drop into the chat on Zoom and on YouTube, uh, is uh, will more than 20% of the text on the internet be generated by GPT-3 or similar deep language models by 2025? Uh, so there's, it's, there's a lot of possibilities, chatbots, um, generating content, uh, all kinds of things. And it could end up that the very uh, data set that was used to train GPT-3 gets filled up with neural network content, uh, which will be an interesting problem. So I'm, we're already starting to see a few answers coming in. So make sure to uh, check, that, uh, check that out. And we'll see at the end of Stacy's talk what, uh, what people said. Uh, so you can uh, you get you can go ahead. I'm I'm done with my little question. No, that's great. Uh, can you just confirm that right now you're seeing slides and right now you're seeing a report? Uh, yeah, takes a report. second for the report to load, but uh, yeah. Okay, great. I just want to make sure that it's uh, switching tabs. Oh yeah. Great. Um, awesome. Then I can get started. Um. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stacy, and uh, I'm a deep learning engineer here at Weights and Biases. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some amazing visualization tools that we have for uh, self-driving uh, tasks on Weights and Biases or autonomous navigation more generally. And as an outline, I'll, I'll dive into some specific uh, sub-problems in, in self-driving and the tools we have for those, uh, semantic segmentation, 2D object detec detection and 3D object detection. Um, I'll then give an overview of some of the collaboration tools that are generally useful for anything you're working on uh, and do a deep dive on a report that I have on um, a particular semantic segmentation uh, problem and set of models and how I used weights and biases to help figure that out. Um, and I'd love your questions. I generally might keep this a little bit on the shorter side and then see what people want to dive into and also have interactive examples. Uh, so first, focusing on semantic segmentation. Um, this is a task where, uh, given an image, in this case, it'll be a, a dashboard scene from the dash of a, of a car. Uh, you need to label every pixel in the image as belonging to a particular class or category. Uh, my models have been training with 20 different um, of these categories or labels, so that's car or tree or building or road or human, um, bicycle, et cetera. Um, and different, different models have different labels, uh, but those are sort of the main ones that we care about. You can also imagine doing this on videos. And I have some links here if you want to check out some code examples. There's a cool Kaggle competition for this from CVPR 2018. Uh, you can also extend this to segmenting drivable area. So knowing which lane is available for a car to switch into. And this um, is encapsulated in a great uh, data set, Berkeley Deep Drive 100K. I've been using this a lot. It has um, lots of self-driving uh, car-related tasks and data sets. Um, and the solution that we provide for this at Weights and Biases is semantic segmentation masks, which let you easily and interactively compare model predictions to ground truth. Let's see if this works. I'm going to jump into a report. That I made for this. And you can uh, check this out and try it yourself in a collab notebook here. Um, but just to give you an overview, this lets you um, separately log the examples that you're using the raw photos for your model, and then the uh, class annotations for them. So in this case, uh, you can see that this human is um, not tagged here, but here we can see uh, them outlined in uh, orange. You'll also see that this uh, should be road, but it's classified as sidewalk. And I think this is because it's overfitting on lots of examples where humans are generally on or next to the sidewalk. And um, one, or the most amazing aspect of uh, this feature is that you don't need to log fixed uh, layers in advance. You can interact interactively decide which classes you care about and how to overlay them over your um, training images. So uh, here you can see more of these examples interactively. And from the controls here, you can turn on and off any of the classes. Um, these are ground truth and prediction masks overlaid with the 
initial results and the final results. So you can see, say, the prediction of the human uh, converging much more on the uh, ground truth label. Another way you can um, lay this out is just looking at the final predictions for, uh, for each model. And uh, let's jump into the results for a particular one. Um, here, all three, um, so the, the raw photo, the model's prediction, and the ground truth, all three of those masks are overlaid on top of each other, uh, which looks pretty cool, but might be a little hard to read. Like here, we see that the ground truth annotation gets the bus, but it looks like we've labeled it in a different color. Uh, so one thing we can do is split these up so that we get all three masks separately. And now we can see that the correct labeling is bus, but it looks like this example actually has it labeled as a truck, which we can confirm by toggling the truck on and off. And then we can sort of scroll through these and see how it's generally doing. Uh, here's another example where you know, the truck is actually labeled um, as a car. And that's understandable. That's a pretty uh, uh, easy confusion to make. Plus, you can see the details like the traffic uh, poles that it's actually doing pretty well on here, um, but maybe not getting some of the detail, especially in faraway cars. Um, and so I, I'm just showing a bunch of different examples here. Uh, let's hop into a different feature. Um, 2D object detection, which is another classic problem in uh, self-driving. What we want to do is uh, draw a box, bounding box, around an object that we care about, say a car uh, or a human or, again, a traffic sign. And you can do this in 3D as well. There's a great uh, lift uh, data set for this on Kaggle. And uh, what we do for this in Weights and Biases is enable you to uh, see bounding boxes with an interactive slider for confidence level. And let me again hop into a report where I am again training on the Berkeley Deep Drive. This is uh, this time it's not semantic segmentation, it's a YOLO v3 network for object detection. And here you can just at a glance see a bunch of the bounding boxes and you can um, zoom into it a little bit like this. And I can set the score slider, you know, maybe it's too noisy. I'm gonna set it higher. Uh, and you can see that a lot of the low confidence ones disappear. You can toggle them on and off. You'll notice this bus, for example, um, blinking in and out. What else does this model detect? Benches, fire hydrants, airplanes. I don't think there's any airplanes in the validation data set. Um, and you can, of course, show this zoomed in and use this to debug the details of your model. You know, this is, this is doing really well here on people, even getting this one in the background. Um, but it does, for example, miss this tiny fire hydrant here. You can see that there's some overlap between trucks and cars, and you can read the confidence score here. Um, and you know, if you, if you check out these reports, you can see that the, the syntax for logging this is really easy, and we take bounding boxes as both uh, relative and absolute coordinates, um, and it's all nicely done for you. And uh, hopping back into a different feature, 3D object detection. Um, and here we're looking at point clouds generated from LiDAR. Um, this is again from the LIFT data set. It's um, really cool to play with this, uh, with this data. And what we let you do in weights and biases is actually log and interact with the point cloud. And we'll see if this works in present mode. Um, but basically, I can expand one of these. Oh, oh. Um, this might be a little much, but you can. Um, I think that's going to be too much for the browser. But basically, you can just trust me that you can pan and zoom and rotate around the map and see how the bounding boxes uh, here. The ground truth is in green, and the predictions are in yellow. Sometimes they overlap. Um, sometimes the model doesn't quite get the correct orientation for the car or thinks a tree is a person, etc. Um, so this is another fun logging tool. And then uh, hopping back, right, this is um, a link to the report. And um, maybe you can see here a more detailed example, you know, when the boxes are lined up, that means our model uh, got a pretty good prediction of the ground truth. 
but then there's cases in both directions, lots of predictions that are actually picking up on some noise. Although this here could be a car that we've detected that was unlabeled in the original data set. Um, and now zooming out to collaboration tools, um, the, um, the sweeps, workspace, and reports functionality are really useful for self-driving problems I found, but they're also useful generally. I think from here, I'll just hop into a report of mine uh, that focuses on semantic segmentation and we'll wait for it to load. And reports are specifically very useful to uh, write down intermediate results and share them with colleagues or other folks um, who might be interested in your work. Here I first describe uh, the task, which is taking these raw photos and then generating these predictions. And I can compare them to the ground truth. You'll notice that this is the old style. I'm not using the fancy interactive image masks because those didn't exist when I made this report. Um, and you can see the model's doing pretty well. For example, it's getting these humans. Uh, but you can see here that this um, bicycle rider is not identified as a bike and a rider. It's just a human, right? And um, some of the details of these uh, traffic posts are, are, aren't, aren't detected correctly. And you'll see there's some haziness here. And that's probably the probably because the light quality is, is pretty weak in this original photo. Um, yeah, so you, you can see it's a little bit trickier to compare across these than having the overlaid masks. Um, maybe someday I'll, I'll upgrade this report. Uh, and here I talk a little bit through uh, the task. I'm using code um, made by my colleague, Boris, uh, that's a unit in FastAI. And I'm using different encoders to see basically how well I can identify different classes. And in the process of working on this, um, I noticed that uh, although I was getting a high average accuracy, um, it was doing really well on cars and traffic signs, but really poorly on humans when I split it up into per class accuracy. So here, for example, you can see that all of the car accuracies for three different models in these solid lines are um, you know, in, the, in the low 90s, even as high as 95, which is pretty good. Um, the dashed lines are traffic, and that's like the most detailed and the hardest to get. So they're relatively lower across models. And then the dots is the overall accuracy, and that's you know coming in at around the high 80s across models, which is pretty good. But if you look at uh, human accuracy, it's it's incredibly low. And partially this is because uh, human pixels don't take up that much space in the data, you know, compared to the number of pixels that are occupied by cars or roads. Humans are just a very tiny fraction of that. So it also doesn't get to see that many examples. Um, so one thing that I found a change that was really helpful was to look at intersection over union instead um, as the metric. And uh, intersection over union is sort of like a Venn diagram. So instead of looking at the percentage of pixels that are correct, you look at the overlap uh, between the predictions and the ground truth for a given class. Um, and this helped me train models that were much more accurate overall the one interesting detail that I found when I varied um, encoders for my unit is that um, the best performing uh, model or encoder type for a human IOU was AlexNet. Um, but overall, it was less good than a ResNet because it would predict these, um, this is a representative example here, these blocky humans and get a lot of, a lot of intersection, right? But not actually capture any of the details and definitely not capture you know, um, this tiny, tiny human in the background here, maybe it's even a pair. Um, and, you know, this just shows some of the awesome report features to just do a diff of two of my model configs. Um, some more examples from AlexNet, another mode that it would get into is just pick up on the very, very fine details of the photo instead of the, the broad um, categories. Um, there's more examples here, and I'll scroll through to the part where I run a sweep. Um, and a sweep is a, a nice UI for hyperparameter search from weights and biases, where you can just specify some of the hyperparameters you want to explore, like learning decay, or sorry, <laughs> learning rate, weight decay, training stages, and then uh, launch agents that will basically try your same training script, but with different hyperparameter values. And then you'll get nice visualizations of that training over time and this parallel coordinates plot. And uh, every experiment that I ran is a line here that's connecting values on these vertical 
um, number lines. And you can see that the high accuracies are in, are in yellow and the lower ones are in purple. And these um, are just failed experiments. Um, and you can see that there's not a clear relationship with weight decay, it's sort of all over the place. We don't have a strong uh, signal. For training stages, it looks like the lower ones are better, but also I tried, tried a lot more experiments with lower values. And then for learning rate, it seems like the lower, you know, lower learning rate generally correlates with higher accuracy. And it's nice because you can click into any one of these experiments. Um, I then, um, the last awesome bit about sweeps is that we run a random forest for you in the background on your hyperparameters and your target metric. So here for human IOU, if that's the one I care about, it turns out that the AlexNet encoder is the highest um, predictor of, of good human IOU, and it's very highly correlated here, while decreasing the learning rate, as we just saw from the sweep, uh, is the next most important thing. And of course, you want to increase the number of training examples, et cetera. And weight decay, as you can see, doesn't, doesn't really matter that much. Um, what's cool is I can switch this and pick a different target metric, like average IOU across all of my classes, not just humans. Um, and here we'll see that the learning rate matters a lot. Um, you know, the number of examples matters a lot. Uh, and then actually ResNet is more useful because it's, it's a much more advanced model and more precise overall. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that particular um, report. And these are just some, some screenshots of what I showed. I, um, there's a really cool visual in sweeps that I want to briefly show, which plots every experiment over time um, as it comes in. These are just some metrics for some of my experiments, so training loss, car accuracy, and it's awesome that you can customize these in a dashboard. Um, here it is. So these are all the experiments I ran, all the uh, different combinations of hyperparameters. And you can see the IOU, which is my target metric, improving over time. And the best run is, is, is this one. And I can um, find that configuration of hyperparameters and use it in my future experiments. Um, so all of this is ongoing work. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hopefully it's a reasonable overview of the kinds of things you can do with um, what, weights and biases tools for self-driving. Though, of course, I have a whole appendix of other fun sub-problems in self-driving that can go on for much longer. Wow. Yeah, um, I'm always impressed by just the like breadth of uh, problems that you've tackled uh, using, using, the, using the tool. It's, uh, yeah. As somebody who has done a lot of more theoretical machine learning work in which, you know, it's MNIST and CIFAR most of the time, it's, it's wild <laughs> to see, you know, just how much else there is out there. Um, so what would you say is the biggest insight that you gained from, uh, from using the sweeps tool on your self-driving um, on your self-driving problems, or I guess, or even more broadly, like, can you think of like one specific instance of really strong insight driven by in, in any of the examples that you showed that you want to highlight? Uh, yeah, definitely. That's a great question. So um, initially, I was running these sweeps to maximize accuracy, um, and I was then logging separately my metrics for accuracy on different classes, and I was noticing that you know I was trying a bunch of stuff, but basically there was no signal for human accuracy. And when I switched to uh, IOUs, um, I actually set my search space wide enough that some of the sweeps uh, generated um, signal for human IOU. And these were combinations of um, sampling and settings that um, would actually give you know, some, some signal on this. Uh, and that was really cool to see. Although a lot of them have AlexNet uh, as the encoder, so then there's a question of um, you know, focusing in on the search space, seeing what the best ResNet ones are. Um, but it's really awesome to be able to let the sweep run and then discover a direction to follow based on what that sweep finds instead of manually trying it myself. Mm, I see. Yeah, but in a very sort of iterative way, like you try something, there's a whole bunch of things, maybe, you know, a lot of your runs fail, you know, uh, some more than <laughs> others, but then that tells you, the, the where to go next, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can even configure, I call this iterative sweeps. You know, you, you have some findings from a stage of experiments and then you set a new search space or go deeper in one direction. 
exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so folks in the in the Zoom or on the uh, YouTube, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and submit them. And uh, but while you're doing that, I'm going to take a look at the responses to our survey, and we'll come back to them. Uh, come back to Stacy with any questions that pop up. So uh, it looks like we got an exactly equal number of answers for the two possibilities. So the reveal step here is maybe a little bit less exciting than it could be. But let's see what people said. Uh, all right. Uh, it, it was an option actually to pick both yes and no if you wanted. Uh, so uh, that maybe, you know, it's a, it does not compute sort of divide by zero kind of answer. But uh, yeah, it looks like people picked, people are, are about equally, about an equal number of people think it's definitely going to happen and it's definitely not going to happen uh, by 2025. I'd be interested to know, maybe people can drop this in the in the chat somewhere whether people think that maybe my date was too aggressive that, uh, or uh, that maybe it's 2030 or 2035, uh, or if people think that that's totally impossible. So if you have thoughts about that, drop that in the chat. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A for Stacy. Uh, so aside from AlexNet, which CNN backbone did you find that provides the best results for your image segmentation tasks? And do you think that there's sort of like a single answer to that for all kinds of tasks? Um, I, I think it's hard to uh, say that it'll be for all kinds of tasks. The ones that I tried here were AlexNet, ResNet 34, and um, a smaller number for ResNet 18, I believe. Um, and, um, you know, ResNet 34 does the best across classes, and AlexNet has this edge on humans because it actually predicts these large blocky regions. Um, one interesting thing is with semantic segmentation, uh, my batch size needs to be a lot smaller than the kinds of CNN problems that I'm used to because there's just so much signal of prediction for each pixel. Um, and, you know, more complicated encoders would just require a little bit more optimization in order to, to train at a reasonable speed on my GPUs. Um, interesting. Uh, yeah, it seems uh, it seems plausible to me that, yeah, that there's not necessarily one right answer. Uh, it's probably a good idea to try out multiple uh, multiple models from the model zoo, um, but, you know, for every task, every time you come up with something new. Definitely. And I tried, you know, a bunch of the default available ones in fast AI, and you could, you know, customize from there for sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, but the but the the thing about AlexNet produ pr predicting relatively blocky regions that's an architectural constraint of AlexNet, right? Due to the like, um, just due to the, the like numbers on the convolutions in the pools. Um, it's. I think we could get into you know more finer architectural <laughs> uh, distinctions, but I think overall you know it, it does less well as an older and much simpler architecture, or at least that's the way that I understand it. So when we're looking at these giant images and these fine details, um, it's not generalizing as well. I see. Yeah. Uh, just curious if that if that AlexNet finding viewers would, would be just like a general property that would be sometimes good, sometimes bad, depending on your task. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's possible to fine tune this particular AlexNet version for this encoder and in a better way, you know, I'm just taking mm. the pre-trained version, so. Gotcha. Cool. All right. Uh, thanks, Stacy, and thanks, uh, Han, for the great question. Uh, and I think it is, uh, it's my turn. So, uh, all right. So this talk, let me pull up my slides. I think I've got that going for everybody. Uh, so, uh, so taking us a little bit out of the realm of applications that Mohammed Reza and Stacy had us in, I wanted to talk about a core algorithm, a core idea from linear algebra that shows up in machine learning quite a bit, the singular value decomposition. And what I want to convince you by the end of this talk is that the singular value decomposition is a refactor. So the singular value decomposition, if you're not familiar with it, it's a very important algorithm, just some examples of the SVD in action. Principal components analysis is an application of it. it the discrete Fourier transform is an application of singular value decomposition, which includes JPEG, the image encoding technique. 
uh, computing the pseudo inverse, which actually came up, I don't know if you noticed it in Mohamed Reza's talk, uh, computing the pseudo inverse was an important part of the RBF training step. And computing the pseudo inverse is typically done via the singular value decomposition. It's that is related to why it shows up when we try and solve uh, linear regression. If all of those examples seem a little bit too perhaps academic for you, uh, video foreground isolation, recommendation engines, page rank, and more, uh, all these very uh, useful application domains, the singular value decomposition shows up. Uh, and despite that you know, broad array of applications, it's actually deceptively simple. The singular value decomposition simply states that we can break a matrix down into three particular pieces, which usually go by the names U, sigma, and V transpose where U is a matrix that's usually kind of tall and skinny. Uh, v transpose is a matrix that's kind of wide and short, uh, a squat. Uh, and then in between is a matrix sigma that is uh, a diagonal matrix. So this is a singular value de decomposition. And this way of writing it sort of emphasizes the idea that this matrix M on the left is equal to the product of the matrix matrices on the right. Uh, but I think there's a slightly different view that I want to take that's going to lead us to this view of the SVD not as like an algebraic equation, but instead as a process akin to refactoring and programming. And first, we need to change a little bit the way we think about matrices. So matrix vector multiplication is more like function application than it is like the multiplication of scalars. We, we should think of a matrix not just as an array of numbers, though sometimes thinking of it that way is helpful, but instead as an object that takes in certain kinds of inputs and returns certain kinds of outputs. So on this slide, I'm showing a matrix M in red, taking in a vector X in blue and returning an output, M, which we call M times X, uh, that is in purple and is also an array. Uh, and uh, so this view, sometimes it's useful to think of matrices as a bunch of numbers, other times, it's useful to think of them as functions that act on vectors. So this singular value decomposition is a decomposition of a function. It's taking the matrix M and undoing the process of composing it. Functions uh, are composed. They are combined together, one function after another. Uh, and the end result of composing a bunch of functions is also a function. So that's expressed by this diagram on the right-hand side here. So the way to read a diagram like this, let me pull up my uh, laser pointer, is that we start up here in the top left with an array with n entries. And m is a function represented by an arrow that takes us from n entry arrays to m entry arrays, lowercase m uh, on the size of the array. Uh, but we can alternatively think of this arrow here as a sequence of arrows, as a sequence of steps, V transpose followed by sigma followed by U. Uh, so that's this, the content that is on the left-hand side here expressed as an equation is also expressed by this diagram here. These diagrams, commutative diagrams is what they're called, say that if I follow these arrows and end up at the same place as following any other path, then I must get the same result. Uh, so that's saying that uh, v transpose followed by sigma followed by u is the same as m. So this, uh, if we think of our, of our singular value decomposition as a decomposition, as the reversal of composition, the connection to refactoring becomes a little bit more clear. Refactoring programs involves a couple of common tricks. Separation of concerns to say this function does one thing and this function does another. I don't mix them all together, peas and carrots together, cats and dogs lying together you know, these sorts of, of awful things. Uh, we also sort of remove code that doesn't do anything. Oh, I don't actually need to check that. It's guaranteed not to have that value. Um, this code is dead. It no longer refers to anything of use. Those are examples of refactoring tricks. Breaking up into functions is another important refactoring trick, decomposing functions that have been already sort of pushed together too much. And these all have direct equivalents for matrices. So for separation of confer concerns, we have eigenvectors and eigen decomposition to sort of split up a matrix from a whole bunch of things happening all at once to you know, n things happening on n different eigenspaces or eigenvectors. For throwing out code that doesn't do anything, we have low rank approximation. This part of the matrix is unimportant. I will throw it out. This part of the code doesn't do anything. I will delete it. 
And for breaking up into functions or decomposing, we have singular value decomposition. When we refactor software, this decomposition step looks something like this. I have some function here on the right that's very tersely written. This one here returns the string true if the input is odd and the string false if the uh, input is not odd. I can break that up into three steps, just sort of looking at this guy and saying, OK, what are the pieces of this function? First, we use mod 2 to sort of check whether the, th the input is divisible by 2 or not. Then we, you, we treat that value as a Boolean, not just as a number. Uh, so not just as 0 or 1, but as true or false. That's in the if-else step. And then finally, we return a string for our final output. So we return true. If the, if the Boolean is true, and we return false as a string if the Boolean is false. So we can break those out and make those all separate functions. And now our is odd function at the top is a sequence of three operations that are written out uh, rather, uh, rather than the sort of tightly compacted thing that's on the left. It's a matter of taste, maybe, which of these is the right way to write it. And maybe neither is really the right way to write it. But the important thing is that we can do it. We can split this function up if we want. And we can take this function, that it, this set of functions, and we can collapse them down into a single one. That's the, this is the process of refactoring and rewriting software. And in this case, one function is being decomposed into three pieces. So this should remind you a little bit of that diagram of the SVD I showed just a few slides ago. So we start off with an integer that we want to check whether it's odd. And if we feed it to the function is odd, what we should get out is a string, true or false. Maybe we're printing this to, uh, to a user who wants to know whether their input is odd or not. And what this diagram is saying is that we can apply three separate functions and get the exact same result. So this way of writing is odd really emphasizes that it is implemented in this particular way as mod 2, then 2 bool, then 2 string. Mod 2, uh, the 2 bool function checks whether that mod 2 output is equal to 1, uh, and the 2 string one just takes that Boolean and turns it into a string. So let's, let's talk about what those three pieces are. So the way of understanding those three pieces in a way that is going to generalize is to say that they do three separate things. That mod 2 picks out sort of representative examples, that 2 bool reversibly renames them, and that 2 string then gives them the right type for the output. So to be more specific, when I say that mod 2 picks representatives, what I mean is that we need a representative for each output one representative integer that is, the, that is the example of an odd number, and one that is the example of an even number. So mod 2 corresponds to picking as our, as our examples 0 and 1. Somebody else might use 1 and 2 as their examples. They would have a different function than mod 2, but they, but they would be doing in this decomposition the same thing, saying, uh, I want to pick out a representative even number and odd number, because that's what uh, that those are the things that I give different answers for, and it simplifies our function down. We just need to know how it works on two different inputs rather than on every possible input, and then we need to know which group each input falls into. Uh, so then, two bool reversibly re reversibly renames those inputs, so it associates each representative with its output, sort of one to one in a way such that each output is targeted by exactly one representative. So we have 0 and 1, right? We have an odd, we have an example odd number, and we have an example even number. And now we just need to sort of be like, OK, which one of these, which one of these is which? Is 1 the odd number, or is 0 the odd number? So 1 is the odd number, so it goes to true, and 0 goes to false. And that's this step here, 2 bool. And then finally, we need to put them in the correct type. So our output there was not necessarily the right type. It was just true and false. Uh, and so we need to recognize the output of our function inside of our output type. There are many strings besides just true and false. There's true and false for one. Uh, there's the, you know, the uh, all kinds of books and the content of this presentation. All of that is inside the type string. Lots of stuff besides true and false. So, but, so we need to find inside true, we have to find the outputs that we want to associate with our two values. So we just say the Boolean true becomes the string true, the Boolean false becomes the string false. Pretty straightforward, relatively simple step. 
But the and this is this may seem a little bit trivial with this function, but if any function you can do this three step composition where I take some function func and first I do an onto transformation where I pick out representatives. Okay, so I have a representative for each type of output I'm going to give. Then I apply a reversible function that says, okay, this representative is the one that gets this output. You know, one is an even number. Two, uh, two or zero is, um, sorry, one is an odd number. Zero uh, is an even number. That's the reversible step. And then lastly, we have a one-to-one -one step where we sort of recognize that output that we had, which might not be every possible value uh, of the output type. We recognize that as a subset of the output type. So that's the final step here. I broke it down into foo bar bars um, for you know for cultural reasons of how how programmers like to like to write these things. Uh, but those three steps onto reversible one to one are a general way to break down literally any function. So you can if, you know if you need to refactor a function, consider this three step breakdown as a way of of breaking down the function. So any matrix can also be decomposed into three pieces. And because matrices are simpler than any possible function, we can do a lot more than just breaking them down into those, uh, those three very generic types of, of pieces. Uh, so if we, break, if we apply this decomposition to a matrix, uh, we get that we can split it up into three pieces, a wide matrix, a square matrix, and a tall matrix. The wide matrix has inputs that are bigger than its outputs, right? How wide a matrix is tell you how big its inputs are, how tall it is tell you how big its outputs are. And so what this is doing is it's doing the same thing of picking representatives that uh, was done in the previous example by mod two. Uh, so for linear functions, for things that are implemented by matrices, if two inputs are sent to the same output by the matrix, both of them are sent to zero. And zero is sent to zero by any linear function. And so what this is what this is basically doing is this matrix is going to take everything that gets sent to zero by M and send it to zero, but basically not do much else. Uh, so that's the first step. That's the pick representatives step. Then we have the reversible relabeling step. So that's the matrix in the middle. Here it's B. That one's uh, it's reversible, so it's square. Its inputs are the same size as its outputs. If it were not square, then there'd be no way to match inputs and outputs. Uh, sort of a you can't put toothpaste back in the tube kind of principle. Uh, so this is our relabeling step, this middle one. Uh, this is where we're sort of really doing most of the meat of the work. Uh, and then finally, we have this tall matrix where the outputs can be bigger than, than the inputs. And this one basically finds a copy of all arrays with some number of entries among the set of all arrays with a larger number of entries. So I could do that where like maybe the first R entries are all, uh, all have a value and then the last M minus R are all zero or they're all two or they're all whatever I want. Uh, and then, uh, or I could do it where, you know, the last R are the ones that have, en have entries. It's gonna depend on exactly the details of the matrix M and what function it does. But basically A is going to find a, uh, a copy of this R dimensional space that our middle matrix mapped onto inside the outputs. And it will, it will, it's gonna do that in such a way that it gets the same answers as M applied to the original input. So this is the part where we recognize that, okay, true and false aren't the only strings that exist. There are many strings out there, uh, but uh, so let's take true and false and turn them into strings, even though we know our function you know, can't produce all possible strings. Uh, so in this, in this breakdown, that number R there is the rank of the matrix. It's the dimension of, of things that don't get mapped to zero by that matrix. Uh, and that is the, um, that's going to be the size of the, the input of that uh, last array there, A. And so in order to get the singular value decomposition, we just need to make some special choices, right? I said A, B, and C were pretty free to change around. I could multiply C by a number and divide A by a number, and I would get the same result. So if we make some specific choices, then we get the singular value decomposition. If we make B diagonal and we make A and C unitary, then, our, then we get this SVD. So unitary means no growing or shrinking of anything. So one motivation for doing that is that our diagonal matrix in the middle, that, uh, 
that B can do all the growing and shrinking for us, right? Our first step was just picking out representatives. And our last step was just recognizing our outputs in uh, like our outputs inside another type. Uh, and so there's no need to really grow or shrink there. So we can put that all in all in the middle uh, in that uh, in that diagonal matrix. So the growing shrinking, uh, so no growing and shrinking, but maybe some turning around and some uh, and some reflecting and things like that. That's what's allowed by unitary transformation. And if we do that, uh, that gives this generic style of decomposition that can be applied to any possible function. If we make these specific choices, then we get the singular value decomposition as the output. Uh, as a technical note, this specific choice of the exact shapes here is what's called a compact SVD. So you might see something slightly different, but the principle of breaking a matrix down into these three pieces that are doing effectively the same three things uh, is going to hold no matter what kind of SVD it is that you're computing. The compact SVD happens to be most useful when you're doing maybe a little bit more algebra type stuff, uh, whereas the other kinds are maybe more useful when you're doing actual numerical computing. Uh, so this is just sort of one perspective on the SVD, and it's an it's a uncommon one. Um, I, I came up with it while trying to understand pseudo inverses and then found a couple of other people talking about this, but it doesn't seem to be the most common way to think about the, the SVD. But I do think it gives me a, a sort of different and interesting insight into what's going on. Um, and I guess the only last point I'd make is that this, this style of decomposition comes from something called the first isomorphism theorem, uh, which gets used in abstract algebra all over the place and actually gives you different insights depending on which structure it is you apply it to. And it uh, tends to show up and sort of develop really interesting concepts no matter what it is you apply it to, whether it's group theory or fields or ring theory or whatever it is you're doing with your algebra. This first isomorphism theorem shows up and it gets generalized very broadly in category theory to be applicable to just an absolute bewildering array of mathematical objects. And every time it gets applied, a new interesting concept pops up. Uh, so it's cool to me that this singular value decomposition, which is also this workhorse algorithm, uh, shows up among these uh, um, as, this, as this deep mathematical concept. Uh, so with that, I will, uh, I'll close out my talk and I will uh, take any questions if, uh, if folks have them. Let me pull up the right, uh, uh, the right Zoom setting. Looks like the YouTube is a few seconds behind us, maybe even 30 seconds. Uh, so it might take a little bit of time for them to catch up. Uh, looks like, oh, my, my, co -ho oh, my old co-host, Lavanya, has shown up in the top chat to say she did a great, great talk. Thanks, Lavanya. Uh, feels, you know, feels a little bit about like when you're, um, you know, if, you're, if your mother calls you a, a handsome young man, you know, it's like, thanks, thanks for the compliment. Uh, it, uh, it means a lot. All right, well, it doesn't look like there are any questions. So I'll just, uh, before we close out, I'll share my screen really quickly uh, and just say that, um, uh, so my, my job here at Weights and Biases is to be a deep learning educator to sort of reach out to our community of deep learning engineers, practitioners, enthusiasts, and amateurs, uh, and help them learn a little bit more about deep learning and ideally also how to use the weights and biases experiment tracking tool. So please reach out to me at charles at uh, uh, or on Twitter, twitter.com slash charles underscore IRL. I'd be happy to answer questions, talk with you about work you've been doing, learn about your projects, uh, you know, and just uh, talk about mathematics and machine learning and I don't know, Dungeons and Dragons if you're also into that. Um, so uh, with that said, I think we're, uh, um, I think we are uh, done with our uh, uh, with our salon for the week. So I will catch you all uh, in two weeks at our uh, next salon. Take care.